So we'll just have a couple of minutes of chatting before we get started. Exciting. Okay. All right, and now streaming live on custom live streaming service. Welcome everyone. <laughs> Hopefully we are going strong here. Sorry for the late, um, the late uh, entry here, but uh, Scott usually does this part and I'm just an associate, so come on. <laughs> it's gonna take me just a little longer. All right, Robin says, yay, we are in, we are in. So thank you uh, for your patience, nice. appreciate it. Well, uh, welcome those of you who are joining us. This is our Calvary Forum and we've got, for some of you who uh, will be a familiar face, the Reverend Hester Mathis, who is uh, senior associate over at Holy Communion. Correct. Here, here in Memphis and uh, maybe uh, better well known from, from our folks as a former Calvary parishioner, right? You bet. For How long was that? How long ago were you uh, at, Cal at Calvary? You know, it's uh, birth to seminary. So that would be uh, until 2011 when we took off to uh, meet you in Virginia at VTS. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So for, for everyone who's not, uh, for, for everyone but me, you may know her from these two things, but um, for me, I know Hester because we were in the same class at seminary. I was coming from the Diocese of Arkansas and you were coming from, from uh, West Tennessee. And that is where we met and became friends. And who knew I would be into that in place. <laughs> the magical circle of the Episcopal Church. <laughs> yeah. And then when we moved back, it was nice having you right across the river in Arkansas, so. <laughs> I was placed over in Jonesboro, which was only an hour away. So when I needed a dose of sanity um, in my life, I would come and collapse into Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> the couch was ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, so I'm really glad uh, you're joining us today for uh, these these talks, which we imagine um, will be going for for a while now we've only been doing it for a couple of weeks but we had a couple of chats with me and Paul and Scott on uh, on COVID and the incarnation which was really fun and we thought well that worked well so let's keep let's keep at this and I'm really glad to welcome you um, because uh, yours you are actually with us because you are on sabbatical right now uh, in Holy Communion and look at you getting all dressed up for the occasion even though <laughs> You could be in your PJs right now, and we really appreciate it. Well, it felt good to have a reason to dress up. Good, good. Yeah, well, there you go. And it's just, you know, the Zoom shirt. You could still have pajama bottoms. You know, nobody will know. So welcome, Hester. And I, what are you working on uh, in this sabbatical time? Uh, because that's really why I invited you, was to get a sense of what um, this, this project that you're, you're undertaking for the next few months yeah, well, I appreciate being invited because uh, sabbatical is such a great time to just kind of take a deep breath and reflect and renew and pick up some of those things that you have great intentions of doing, but then uh, you find yourself proofing bulletins and putting out fires and visiting people and all of those uh, daily things that uh, sometimes keep those uh, big picture projects uh hovering on the back burner. So sabbatical for me is a great time to pick up one of these projects. And uh, that is something that is tying my undergrad degree and my grad degree together. So for those of you who don't know, my undergrad was in music and specifically 20th century American music with a focus on uh, the Delta Blues. So my thesis was on um, a festival that take, takes place every year over in Perugia, Italy, uh, featuring all Memphis musicians. It's called the Sweet Soul Music Festival. And I- oh, so uh, cool, I had no idea. Yeah, it's this amazing journey to say, you know, there are a lot of us in Memphis who take this for granted, this rich musical heritage of the blues. 
Um, and I was one of them. Um, I grew up with it and kind of thought that's, you know, that's normal until I went off to college and realized what a gift um, it was to grow up in this region with this musical heritage and such deep roots to the blues. So this is tying together that passion with the Psalms. So um, in Virginia Theological Seminary, I took a class from Judy Fendris Williams, who a lot of you all might recognize as a, a priest who preached at the bishop's ordination um, at her consecration. And, uh, and William Bradley Roberts, uh, our music professor, and it was called Psalms and the Negro Spirituals. Um, this exploration of musical forms of prayer, musical uh, ways in which we cry out to God. Yeah. And, um, and it was this amazing class uh, that really helped me uh, appreciate the Psalms in a new way. Because before that, the Psalms were just kind of like that, that break in the middle of the readings where you got to participate a little bit in church. Uh, but I hadn't really spent a lot of time studying them. Um, and it was really, it, it opened up my interest in them because the Psalms is one of those few books that really does lift up the entire range of emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no emotion that is too scary for the Psalms. And it kind of, you know, you have Psalm 100 that's make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Uh, then you have these wonderful comforting Psalms of the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want, or I lift my eyes up to the hill from where is my help to come. And, and then you have these really angry, rage, rage Psalms, raging Psalms, you know, all, all those Psalms. <laughs> yes, that name all these emotions that we, you know, of course, being raised in the South, it's like, that is not dinner conversation. It's certainly not church conversation, right? Certainly yeah. not church conversation. And in fact, uh, when Brueggemann came to Memphis early on in um, my time at Holy Communion, he talked about how, you know, almost a third of the Psalms name those harder emotions, but yet, it's Psalm 22, the cry out from the cross, oh God, oh God, why have you forsaken me, is the only one that we really use on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, we shy away from mm -hmm. the prayer psalms, and we don't put them in the lectionary very often. I mean, nobody wants to be sitting in church and hear, you know, I, I, I want to seek revenge and, mm -hmm. you know. It's one of the, been one of the, oh, gifts. it's been oh, one of the, of the, of the daily office you know, because we've been saying it together um, and hearing people's reflections, you know, because when you have a private prayer practice, it's one thing, but when you invite a whole bunch of people into who have never really experienced the Psalms in their breadth, right? You go through the entire book of Psalms in three months, is it, in the, in the daily yeah. office? Um, yeah. But that these things start bubbling up at these times when you least expect them about like how angry you are at this person and how you want to see them as like like childless and and to go off into the dust and that you're, <laughs> you're you know um, get swallowed but, by the leviathan and right, uh, dissolve right. into slime like the snail. I mean, there's some great imagery in there really good and really helpful at certain points and so maybe maybe more helpful at a time when we're under great emotional <laughs> stress um, absolutely yes I mean this is a perfect time to be diving into it because we're feeling all of those emotions mm -hmm. and what Brueggemann says is that these Psalms of Lament allow us to name all of those emotions without like casting this moral judgment on them yeah. without saying okay you are angry and that is because you haven't been praying hard enough, or you don't have enough faith, and that's why you're um, in despair. Or, you know, if you just uh, worshiped more, you wouldn't be feeling hopeless right now. You know, all these moral judgments that we cast on these emotions that we're not supposed to name in mm -hmm. Black Company. And that's what the Psalms allow us to do is to name them and to also seek solidarity because you're naming them in front of other people. I mean, that's what the daily office has been doing for all of you is you can name all of these things in community mm -hmm. and um, that destigmatizes it. It normalizes it and it makes it where you can go, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm not the only one feeling that way. Yeah, um, there's great release. 
and there's something in it that's like there's nothing that I feel that is actually outside of God right. right and the response of a faithful community there's no part of the human experience that isn't involved and in in the, the spirit of who God uh, is and wants us to be there's there's a pathway right yes yes and so as I was taking this class on the Psalms and the spirituals, we're talking about parallelism, which is one of the poetic devices that they use in the Psalms, which is like this A, B pattern, which is, you know, I'm going to name something and then I'm going to name it again with different words to emphasize it, to draw your attention to it, to drive it home. And uh, it's kind of like this idea of a whiny child, right? Like, I hate to eat peas. I hate to eat peas. You're ruining my life by making me eat these peas, right? <laughs> like that third way to say it is like, you are just going to drive this point home to make sure everyone got it loud and clear. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So it's called this A, B, you know, you're going to name it an A, and then you're going to drive it home with the line, the B line, right? And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like, okay, sure, spirituals encompass the whole book of Psalms. You can praise, you can be thankful, you can be grateful, you can be sad, you can be crying out to God. But as far as the Psalms of Lament, when we talk about this, I was like, this is nothing new to me. I've heard this my whole life. And we start talking about this A-B pattern, and I'm flashing back to my undergrad and thinking the entire um, realm of the 12 bar blues, the blues that were 12 measures that were repeated over and over again, this form that has created this springboard for blues, soul, R&B, rock, country, all of those, that was all built on this A-B pattern. And it just felt like this homecoming to me when I heard it, because I was thinking about um, uh the language of the blues, you're crying out, there are these themes of oppression, themes of dislocation, themes of disorientation, and of, um, of crying out in despair in community, and doing it in a way that says, okay, you know, I am angry, I am angry, I am so angry, I don't know what to do with myself. You know, it's like this, you are emphasizing it in that third line. And I just had these songs from B.B. King and from Handy and from Joyce Cobb and from all the greats just going through my head as I'm sitting there in class. And all of a sudden I'm reading Psalms and I'm putting them into blues form. And, uh, and I was like, okay, this all connects. And I think for me, it's a way of connecting an ancient text into a modern context mm -hmm. that I had grown up with and that felt like home and that made it gave me a chance to enter into the text of the Psalms in a whole new way that felt familiar yet new all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, I would have never thought of it like that, the sort of A B um, transition. I was aware of it as a structure in 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 the Bible, just in, in the Old Testament in general, right? Like six things I hate you know, seven are repulsive to me, says the Lord. But then to put that like, oh yeah, that is actually how these songs are. My baby left me. My baby. And then like, and then there's a kind of a res resolution line. And so right. my life is over, you know? <laughs> right. right. And so you look at the Psalms and I mean, there's an example from Psalm 42. So why are you so full of heaviness? Oh, my soul. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, and then it goes on to say, and why are you so disquieted within me? Mm -hmm. So for to put that in a blues form, these 12 measures, and you say A first, and then you say A again, and then you drive it home with B, it would be, why are you so full of heaviness in my soul? Why are you so full of heaviness in my soul? And why are you so disquieted within me? Yeah. So for those of you who are familiar with the blues, you know, you're kind of humming along to yourself right now. Why are you so disquieted within me? You know, is that driving yeah. line? So I'll quickly screen share just to kind of give you a visual to look at this, because um, when you talk about 12 bar blues, the bars are musical measures. 
Yeah, help us out. A measure of four beats. And what the 12 bars blues does is it takes those 12 bars, breaks them into the three lines, A, A, B, mm -hmm. and basically does that on continuous repeat through the entire song, you know, maybe with new lyrics, different things, but I'm going to share this screen. Okay, so you've got that example from Psalm 42 on the left. You've got that A and B. Psalm 137 also uses this. They're talking about uh, the day of Jerusalem, O Lord, against the people of Edom who said, down with it, down with it. So that's your A line. And then B, what's more B, even to the ground. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so that is uh, in those Psalms. Now take that and put it into blues. Here being in the land of Cotton, Arkansas, and uh, Tennessee in the Delta region, I mean, this is the one that first flashed through my mind, and so I had to go find it. And it's Handy, who was talking about the bull weevil, right? You know, not the crazy, you know, masked bull weevils that run around at carnival time in Memphis, but, you know, the bug that actually destroys all the cotton crops and things like that. And he sings in this blues, Bo Weevil, Bo Weevil, where you've been so long. And then you do it again, A again. Bo Weevil, Bo Weevil, where you've been so long. What's more, B? You stole my cotton. Now you want my corn. <laughs> like, <laughs> so you can good. picture, like, this is the same thing. We're doing the same thing that those. Uh, those who were in Babylonian captivity were doing, you know, those who were separated from their homeland, those who were saying, you know, you've destroyed my temple, you've destroyed my crops. Um, I think that you'll probably be getting to this as your chat, but right, there's that similarity in the blues coming from a place um, of oppression, right? Yes. The, 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 uh, to the Psalms, right? The Psalms are coming out of this time. Are you going to be talking about this? I'm sure you are. Yes. Okay. Oh, this, good. Is yes. <laughs> this is it. I'm glad it's, you know, it's leading you in that place because that's it. I mean, you've got a people who are in a foreign land, right? They've been taken from their land. They've been oppressed. They are um, uh, at times in, in great despair. They're talking about these uh, these things which are deeply personal yet universal in their community, right? I mean, they're uh, they're each feeling them in a very deeply personal way. Yet they're all feeling them. And they people like that's so key to understanding the Old Testament that a lot of folks, you know, in Bible studies that I go through, really like we just have to say it over and over. Read this through the lens of a people who have lost everything and these yes. are the stories that they are telling um and so to draw that parallel again uh, with the blues um yeah. it fits really well right so if you take this and you put it into psalm 42 this is what it looks like now this is a musical notation and basically these 12 measures are broken down into you know one chords in this case it's the g chord uh, the G7 chord, uh, four chords, which are these um, C7 chords, and then back to the one chord, and then you go to, I mean, it's like you have this musical form that gives you that, um, that, that guitar riff that you hear behind all of those 12 bar blues um, songs. Uh, so if you're sticking those lyrics on top of this 12 bar form, uh, you have this, oh my soul, why are you so heavy? And then A again, oh my soul, why are you so heavy? And then what's more B? Why are you so disquieted within me? And you can just see like, you yeah. know, this ancient Israelite, you know, in a jute joint, just pouring his soul out. And really good, <laughs> Hester. That's really good. <laughs> So, you know, um, maybe that's just me. <laughs> maybe that's just my imagination. And what is it like, da you know, David plays the lute, right? Like he plays the, the little tiny <laughs> lute. Like, 
some why wasn't he making those chords right like we don't know we don't know probably somebody probably somebody knows out there some sort of ancient music uh i don't even know what you would how how you would study ancient music like that but somebody out there knows it anyway exactly (laughs) yeah yeah so my hope in all of this so this gets me to my sabbatical project is i've been dreaming since that day sitting in um the addison building of virginia theological seminary i've been dreaming of what would it be to take these psalms put them into 12 bar blues and then have local musicians record them what would that sound like if we could get our community in this day and age and location to bring to life this ancient text in a new way? Um, because if I'm making this connection, I imagine others are too, or it's not you know, such a huge leap to say, this is another way that we can explore these Psalms. Mm-hmm. Um, So over sabbatical time uh, with this uh, creative um, opening, I'm going to take a handful of Psalms and Laments and I am, uh, I've written the lyrics to go along with the Psalms uh, because, you know, of course you're getting into uh, the, the rhythm and the rhyming and the, you know, kind of the feel of it. You've got to work with the text a little bit and move it around and mm-hmm. you're going to say things in a way that, that feels like the blues, but also honors that ancient scripture and, um, and then give it to local musicians to record and to bring a piece of themselves to it as well. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, hoping to have some artists also exploring these psalms at the same time and offering their visual reflections on them. And I think right now, uh, the reason it really stands out to me that this is the right time to pursue this, one, is because I've been talking about it for six years, and I'm finally getting the chance to, to really focus on it, uh, two, because I feel like in the middle of a pandemic, these themes are resonating. Yeah. They're especially important because it's not just a viral pandemic, right? Like we've been dealing with these social justice issues, these racial inequity issues, these um, mental health issues, all of these things that um, bubble to the surface. Maybe we could kind of pretend like we had control over it before, but we get under stress and all of a sudden all of that stuff just comes out from under the rug and we have to deal with it in new ways, which is, it, to me, it's a gift to, um, to name it all and to feel it all. Um, so for instance, I was working on uh, in early January. This is just, this is insane. And it shows how universal and generation to generation these themes are, but I was working on Psalm 74 early. Okay. January. Remind us, remind those of us who are having Yes, Psalm 74, <laughs> the subtitle is Help in Time of National Humiliation. Ooh, ooh. So I'm watching the Capitol riots. Yeah. As I am deeply into a psalm that is talking about what do we do when our temple is destroyed and we are brought to the ground. It's like, oh, you know, that's, it's powerful. And it's powerful to say, okay, we are not the only ones who have experienced times of disorientation. This is something our ancestors. And it's interesting to like, when you start to see, I don't know, yourself uh, as more than just you know, this, this little, you know, as a very contained little unit, right? Because that isolation being one of the, the, the major themes Mm -hmm. of our, of our experience in the past year, um, to connect yourself with a story that's playing out, that's actually bigger than you, uh, or that's older than you, or that's sort of an ancient thing, um, that has happened. And, how did the faithful people of God see their way through? Well, part of it was naming it um, for what it was. But I wonder what, you know, what the, you know, the structure of the Psalm, not only just naming it, 
Um, but but there's a movement to it, right? Like the people, as you move through a psalm, you kind of go through a, I don't know, sometimes it's, there's very rarely a tragic arc in the Psalms. Um, it's mostly a sort of comedic one where you're like, you, you start out and you're brought low and then you come out changed on the other end of it. Am I, am, right. right, right. A lot of the Psalms start out with this, you know, uh, God, why have you forsaken me? And then they go through this deliverance story of, oh, but you are the God who led us out of Egypt. You are the God who redeems the world. You are the God who pulls us through these times. So you're right. A lot of these Psalms, even though they are deeply, they are naming all these dark and, um, and exhausted and angry emotions, uh, they, a lot of them bring you out on the other side in a place of hope and right. redemption. Oh, and, and to say something like, like this is exactly the place, the kind of place where God works. You know, we've right. seen all of the other stuff and we've had these, we have examples of Psalms where it's just the world is predictable and everything is right. And, um, and we praise God for it. Um, but really so much of what the Psalms do are, are, are engaging with those themes that you'd rather not find yourself in and then finding God in it anyway. Right. It's yes. not, it's not a prescriptive, like, okay, here's how we, it's, uh, I don't know. It's almost like a, a catharsis or, or what, how would you, exp how would you? Yeah, well, I think that's it. I mean, you're, you're acknowledging and remembering, maybe we've always known this, but we're remembering and acknowledging the fact that God is not just when everything's running smoothly and we are in our pews and we can predict what's coming next and we have control of the situation, or at least we like to think we have control of the situation, but that God is in those times when we're like, you know, it feels like the whole world is rocking beneath our feet and we're not sure what the next step is. And we can't predict. I mean, the number of times I've heard the words uncertain and unprecedented and, um, you know, just all of those things that we're like, oh, please don't say that again. We know, like we have no idea what's coming next. And, you know, we don't like that as people, right? We like knowing what the next day brings and we like having some control over it but this reminds us that god is not just in those predictable moments but in the very unpredictable moments as well I know that you're like i don't know that there's hope in there for me that it's not unprecedented in a way to have yeah. this experience um that you are not just we are just not a uniquely troubled uh society in the world um, that there is a bigger story of people who have maybe not got, had the coronavirus, but they've had the Spanish flu or whatever, you know, and they had yeah. their, their entire livelihoods, um, their entire, I don't know, personhoods uh, as it's rooted in a physical place taken from them. Um, and here are the lessons that we can take from that or the absolutely into a story that's bigger than ours. Yeah. Yeah. And they give us that model of naming all of that because when we name it it gives us some power over it because we can say okay I know what this is mm -hmm. I know that while it is deeply personal it's not unique to my story mm -hmm. in the bigger broader sense my ancestors have been through times like this and they are showing me how to articulate it they are showing me how to get it off my chest. They are showing me how to um, say it in a way that connects me to the community around me. It destigmatizes saying that, you know, we're not hiding it in shame that we feel sad or that we feel um, abandoned by God. <laughs> abandoned by God, right? Yeah. Yes. There, yes. I, there are just things you wouldn't hear someone say in church that, in fact, apparently deeply matter in the life of faith to be able yeah. to say those things when they come around. I wonder if you'd just comment on that a little bit about, um, I don't know, about why this is imp even important to be said. Uh, well, I mean, going back again to Brueggemann, he was like, it gives us a chance to say it and to be our authentic and whole 
selves, right? Uh, rather than a kid, the, the thing that we want God to see. Yeah. Yeah. To not put on this mask of everything is rosy. I mean, I'm the quintessential Pollyanna. I, I'm like always putting the, the silver lining on everything. And you know, that's okay sometimes. But I'm the little dark cloud and you're the silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> I need the end of the psalm where it goes, and yet. <laughs> you know? yeah. I, know. I do need those psalms that are like, oh, but it's going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so for me, it's a real spiritual discipline, right? A spiritual growth. To say, no, actually, some days you just have to sit in the, the places that maybe you're not as comfortable in, and you have to be willing to sit in those places with the people around you, because sometimes they don't want you to come in and give you the silver lining. They don't want you to come in and fix everything for them. They just want you to hear them and to sit with them. I mean, that's that whole, you know, Brene Brown thing where she's like, you know, I don't know if you all have seen the video where it's like, you know, somebody's talking about all of their, their grief and the friend comes in and tries to fix it all. And I mean, that's me, that, that is me to a T. I see myself in that. Mm -hmm. And it's taken me many years to come in and say, you know what? Sometimes it's okay just to say that really sucks. And I'm sorry. And I'm just going to sit here with you because I'm not going to, you know, run away because this is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these Psalms of lament, I think, give us that chance to, to say all of those things and to say them unabashedly, to say them without feeling like we're going to be judged for being in a dark place mm -hmm. at a certain time. And wow, I mean, during a pandemic, we need that more than ever. Definitely. Definitely. Mm. Well, so I wonder if you'd talk about a little bit about the process of uh, um, marrying these ancient psalms to the blues. Uh, what you said, you've got local artists doing it, but I wonder as a sort of personal practice for you, what it's been like getting back into the music of the psalms. Um, you know, if you say the daily office, it's one thing, right? Um, to, to hear the psalms said, um, but as you're sort of starting to explore this, I imagine there's a whole another world that has opened up when you're starting to tie this into the actual music itself. Yeah, I mean, if if any of you all went to see the St. John's Bible Illuminations at the Dixon, uh, one of the most uh, amazing and marvelous pieces of it to me is that the book of Psalms, they've actually throughout the St. John's Bible, they used uh, gold that, that gold leaf to symbolize God because it reflects light back to you. You're able to see your reflection in it. It's this beautiful way to kind of name God without giving him a name. And, uh, and throughout the book of Psalms, you can actually see that the gold dots are ancient uh, musical text. The gold dots actually give the shape of the most, the earliest recorded uh, music that we have. And oh, do you have something? I actually have the St. John psalm. Yay! Um, you can see what she's you talking see those little about. Gold, um, the little gold squares. Yeah, the gold, uh, gold squares. Yeah, so in the book of Psalms, in the St. John's Bible, they give us the earliest recorded musical text of the Psalms. And uh, it reminds us, you know, as Dr. Roberts would always say in seminary, psalms are meant to be sung because we all know that as we're, oh, let me see. There's there you a, go. Like there you go. There with the little bar. And they are sort of like musical bars kind of going around uh, in all of the book. Uh, the yes. gold bars. They're interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's, it reminds us that when we sing or for an artist, when they paint, we are able to unlock, I think, in an entire emotional realm mm -hmm. that, I mean, if anybody has been sitting in a room and heard a piece of music that just immediately gives you chills, gives you goosebumps and 
you have this flood of feeling that uh, you cannot put words to, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are moments in music that, that transcend mm -hmm. our spoken language. Mm -hmm. And being able to explore this range of emotions in the Psalms in a musical way for me unlocks a, a place in my heart that I'm not sure gets unlocked in any other way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm hoping that's true for many people that, you know, the creative arts have suffered more than anything during a time in which singing is mm. not advised, right? In right. community and for good reason, and in which we can't huddle up in museums and, and gather for these creative times, but yet we need the creative arts more than ever because they can unleash pieces of our heart that, that really need to be cultivated and nurtured and shared and experienced um, in order to get us through this. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what the, the ancient Israelites were feeling too. You know, if I'm gonna make it through um, this captivity, if I'm going to make it through the fact that my holiest of places has just been torn down to the ground, if I had to make it through all of this, I need more than words. That's a, and this is, this is preaching to li the literal choir, but when our choir started to, um, come back together to practice, right, of course, they're not able to sing, uh, in the church, but there were these things that, you know, are, choir master or organist worked so hard to make safety measures that they were outside. So they ended up being outside in the parking lot, sitting this long distance away from one another. And the first Wednesday night that that happened, and walking through that parking lot and hearing people harmonize, it was, was enough to make you want to weep. Um, because there's something in our souls that is meant for song. Um, that, right. said, that that really does is unlocked by by song, and yeah, that that will forever be one of my memories of the pandemic of not realizing the sort of um, what do I want like it's almost like a sickness that you don't you don't understand or a weariness yeah. you didn't realize you had until something you know pushes it and then everything kind of caves in. <laughs> the yes. whole structure just caves um, yes my moment was being in a Kroger parking lot of all places uh the Kroger on Sanderlin and there's a man on like an electronic keyboard um over in one of the medians playing his heart out and asking for money, you know, because he had lost his job and had a family and, and he's playing these songs. And all of a sudden I was like, I found myself tearing up and I was like, this is not even great music. It's just <laughs> music. Live music. And so long that I didn't even realize how much I'd missed it. Mm -hmm. And so you put that into say the blues mm -hmm. and you have these people who are, um, going through hell and back, right? I mean, the horrors that they are living um, are, are ones that we are still trying to name and own and uh, process. And so being able to release those within a musical setting, being able to sing their hearts out uh, to other people who, who know what that feels like. That's a release. Mm -hmm. That's a, um, that's, that's like, th this might be the only way I can make it through this. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we had one comment from, uh, uh, Bill Branch, one of your, yeah. your, your guys, uh, about the St. John's Bible that inside the gold chips in the Psalms, are small digital recordings of the monks singing the Psalms. I did not realize that, but whoa. Wow. 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 This is gonna- Oh what? my gosh. I, I want to make a Bible for the Psalms, but wow. Yeah. I think we're gonna keep- The of the Dixon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, it was that last, sorry, it was the last step in that tour uh, was here in Memphis and it was gonna be a huge thing and now 
So it was a little community secret um, hanging out in there. I know, but for those of you who missed it, you can pull up some great uh, kind of mini tours by Bill Branch and uh, several of their docents of the Dixon and kind of get a, a fly on the wall kind of view of the whole thing. Um, and it's just, you know, to me, again, the creativity of the St. John's Bible, bringing ancient scripture into modern context. I mean, when they d explore the genealogy that begins the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, and you see these DNA strands being illustrated through the whole thing. Well, you know, the last illumination we had the Bible, they didn't know what a DNA strand was. So to bring that into a way in which we in this day and age and location can, can explore it mm -hmm. uh, in kind of new frontier is to me the hope behind the sabbatical project. And I can't wait to see what other people bring to this. So, you know, as I talk to musicians and as I uh, begin to talk to visual artists, uh, they're each bringing a piece of themselves to it. And um, what I find is, you know, I've got this idea and this springboard and, um, and their personal stories mm. now going to inform the next step of it. And I can't wait to see how that comes out. Do you have a timeline for this as we're kind of waiting to hear our- yes. Yeah, so I'm on sabbatical until Palm Sunday. And uh, so that's kind of my, you know, hope to get everything uh, at least a little bit, uh, I don't know, in more solid form by then. And then when we can gather again, uh, I hope to do a more public presentation of this so that we can all experience it. But then even before then, uh, you know, I attended a concert by Lyle Lovett and Jason Isbell on Friday night, and it was all on my screen, and yet I felt like they were sitting in my living room. <laughs> yeah. So maybe there are ways, uh, and actually the beautiful part of this too is that a lot of the musicians who before would be on tour mm -hmm. and not accessible, well, even if they're not here in Memphis, um, if they are, you know, Memphis residents and other places or they're moving around, uh, we've learned that the miles don't separate us anymore, right? We can still collaborate together and, and be on a screen together as if we're in the same place. Right, right. Yeah, well, I can't wait to hear it. I was just thinking, um, uh, I don't. I was not steeped in the blues in Kansas growing up uh, there, uh, but had a grandmother who loved them, and so uh, had a little bit of um, just a little bit of an exposure to them. And then uh, when, but moving to Memphis and turning on uh, eighty nine nine WEVL, uh, the you know the volunteer local rate. I mean, it's it's fifty percent blues. It feels like and. Uh, I love that station, and every year they have this blues on the bluff, right? So maybe you right. can, maybe you be up there on your jamming on your piano for your blues. Yes, yes, and you know, if anyone who's tuning in to this has creative ideas or knows somebody who they were like, oh my gosh, this sounds exactly right up their alley, uh, reach out to me because it's at this stage still a work in process, and um, and I'm open to how the Holy Spirit's moving in the entire community and, um, you know, just kind of excited to see where it leads. Right on. Well, thank you so much, Hester. This has been a really enjoyable conversation uh, as all of my conversations are with you, but uh, to spend some time on this particular topic of uh, the blues and the Psalms just, and, and figuring out just where we are uh, in this world. It's been really, um, really enjoyable to me and we're so grateful to you. I know we have, we've had just a running, just so you're not in the dark. We've just had this running stream of, of comments of people saying that they appreciated this conversation too. And um, we're, we're, we're grateful you got up on a Sunday morning in your sabbatical to spend time with us. Thank you. Well, this is a blues for a homecoming. Being able to share this with Calvary is a homecoming for me as well. So I really appreciate all of you inviting me to be able to have this conversation with you because, um, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today without Calvary. So well, thank you. Well, we're blessed to have you back.
uh, even, <laughs> even for just a minute. Thank you, Hester. We are uh, winding up off and uh, I just uh, am grateful, grateful to you for your time and we'll see you. Likewise. Thank you, Amber.